voice man. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, it's an excuse to everyone here. I heard, I'm Douglas, for those who don't know, Douglas White. Um, it's an hotel we're here in the studio that I share with a couple of other artists, so thanks to them for their huge space. And um, Avi Mugrabi, who we are here to celebrate and watch his amazing film Z32. Uh, Avi's an Israeli filmmaker, uh, regarded, I think, as the most important documentary filmmaker in Israel at the moment. I, you know, I, I, he didn't tell me that. I spread this rumor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm particularly known for a kind of uncompromising look on the Israel Palestine conflict and occupation, but as an uh, an amazing filmmaking style. I suppose uh, Abby is over collaborating with um, Al at the moment. Al Weitzman, who is a professor of spatial and visual cultures at Goldsmiths, and also founder of uh, Forensic Architecture, which is a uh, group of architects, artists, filmmakers, journalists, scientists working together to kind of expose and investigate um, <laughs> um, human rights issues and human rights violations across the world, in a particularly using uh, technology to do, to do so. The output is various from, um, from presentations to the UN to gallery presentations, which um, AL has described as being like a stand-in for a court as a way of pre um, presenting evidence on these things. We have Manu Akbari on the end. I like to describe as a force of nature and a, uh, a celebrated Iranian filmmaker and um, Mother of Robin. Mother of Robin, who I should also I may have to introduce at some point because you may have to, uh, you may have to join the panel. Uh, that both his parents are here, and uh, um, but I suppose well, maybe you'd like to say why why we're here today, and because you know this was your idea and organisation. So mm. uh, well, I think thank you very much that uh, you are coming here. It's uh, really I think it's really great day for us and. Uh, honestly, mm, uh, I really well, I really like that it's one of my best documentaries at 22 and I really I think it's it's amazing film that I don't want to talk <coughs> about the film because I want you to watch the film. I don't want to give you any images before the film. But we are talking about other things and also that I start to uh, research about um, Abby's and AL's work that they are working together at the moment and I found really deep, strong connection between both. That uh, for me it was like a theater scene that the, when the light is just, uh, just, on, just coming, this, like, when the light is on one person, you can see just one person and around the person that is completely dark and you cannot see. And for me, it's like a media that gives you the light to make a politics celebrity and other things. And both Ayal and Abby, they are trying to find around the media what happened before and after that news. What happened around in the dark side that the people cannot see. That is really important things for me, honestly. But Ayal, his approach is with other material, architecture and science and mathematics and research and Abby's look at this kind of things with the camera. And it was very interesting for me most of the time when the filmmakers, I know many filmmakers that they are inspired of the location and of the nature, space, audience, it's just like a architect and then after that they start to thinking about the story that they think okay I re I remember that some filmmaker they told me for example Kiara sang about the village some villages in his work and he told me that when I saw that village I thought oh my god I have to tell my story here 
And in Eyal's world, the relationship between moving images and cinema and architect is completely opposite. He's look at to the images and he make that before and after with science and research and architect. That's why both are working together. And I think this combination is really beautiful and is exactly opposite together. And uh, for me, it's just a relationship between moving images that media may give you, and both they never accept it, and they try and find truth. Truth. They try and find what is the truth, honestly. What is the other reality? What is the other side of the that the media, we are surrounded with media every day of love. But that is amazing for me, that you, you have to follow them to find other side of the reality. And it's not just reality, because what is the reality? It's about truth, both. That is really amazing for me, and I would like for the start to talk about this kind of things, that combination between moving image and architect, and also Honestly, sometimes for me, it's like a big, it's a collage. It's a collage that, I remember one night you told me both. You are looking to the one film, short film that the media, Israeli government, mm -hmm. released that, and you try to find many things around that film mm -hmm. for one year, and you did, and you made before, and behind the scene, behind the, Back is like a back is stage, and then after and before. And it's very interesting that when I look at that film, that Avi's work on it, and you made before that film and after with architecture, but they like a collage together with the film and moving images. That is, I think it's really amazing collaboration. And I'm honestly non-stop thinking about this, because I'm opposite from Tel Aviv, I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> that is an interesting from connection between architect and moving images. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we're actually going to have to give yeah. place to start is... is <coughs> I'd like to, I'd well, like to you're, talk You're here to, to, to work together, but the practices, I suppose, are very different. You know, well, we'll see. It's, it's an unusual way around because AI has to leave, so it's unusual that we're not watching the film first and then talking about it. But Z32, as we'll see, has, has an amazing formal structure, which is about a hugely violent situation, but dealt with with this sort of with this humour and sort of surreal musical element that Abby brings to it. So, this kind of very odd poetic angle, and then obviously <coughs> forensic architecture is known for this very sort of scientific approach. And so, what brought you guys together, perhaps to? So maybe we should uh, make a little correction. Okay. So it's uh, we're not really working together. Right. I work for Rian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, this, uh, it's, uh, it's also and not correct. This is what I. <laughs> but it's, it, this is what I wanted to do. Uh, oh. I, I visited uh, his lab uh, a few months ago and was uh, deeply impressed. Uh, of course, I know the work from before, and we we know each other for many years. And uh, I uh, decided I wanted to spend the summer here, and. Uh, uh, be uh, uh, you can call it an intern. It's uh, very funny to have a 60-year-old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I I, re I recruited myself uh, to the team <laughs> and and uh, was assigned to work in uh, on the on a certain project. The project that's uh, uh, designated for the uh, uh, Turner Prize uh, 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 exhibition uh, in September and. Uh, and then uh, things uh, uh, developed from uh, 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 being uh, uh, another uh, edit slave in the sweatshop uh, to uh, uh, also uh, bringing, uh, I, well, I cannot uh, avoid being me, okay? <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, maybe uh, uh, brought us uh, to uh, some uh, clashes of... Uh, of uh, of, con of conceptual thinking, mm -hmm. but uh, this this is something I think came out of this. Class. Yeah, I think that something fantastic came out, and and uh, and this is maybe uh, where our differences are. But uh, uh, it's very I, I'm so happy 
that we could uh, uh, join forces and, mm -hmm. and uh, that, the, uh, uh, that I could contribute to this uh, 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 very soon presentation mm -hmm. at uh, Tate Modern. I think I think I should. I'd like to come back at, at um, these comments and explain uh, perhaps how we work together and what came out of it. But perhaps take a step backward and say why at all uh, forensic architecture got interested in moving images. So I guess that uh, our first, our initial proposition was much more archaeological, in the sense that. Um, we understood the very straightforward kind of the conception of forensic architecture. We understood war is happening in the city. Um, buildings, homes, civilians are being targeted. Uh, people die in their own homes. In fact, most people that die in conflict now die inside of buildings. And out of those, the majority of people that die in war die, or die in buildings die in their own home. So the home is really uh, in buildings play a major role, and the understanding was that we need to find a way to read the rubble, like archaeologists read um, ancient cultures or more recent cultures, and reconstruct from material form and ruin what has taken place. Now the problem that we immediately faced with is that we couldn't go to the places that we were researching. So say the, the war in Gaza began in 2014, Israel goes into Gaza, smashes this place, uh, and uh, we actually were working with Amnesty International, both Amnesty and us, submitted a request to go into Gaza, and we were denied, uh, denied access to, uh, to these places. So to do archaeology, we needed the images of people on the ground that were taking on their smartphones or less smartphones or whatever, cameras, um, they were taking images. A, the act of archaeology became the kind of a media archaeology, media conception. Now, so we needed to develop an understanding of uh, films and how do we work with film, perhaps in a different way than uh, filmmakers work with found footage and those films. Because the, you know, the kind of the building block of modernist political cinema is montage. I, you take a film, from here to here is what is relevant, what I want to use. I cut, cut, mm. I splice, condense time and space with another bit of footage, mm. and compose a kind of a narrative, or compose a reality in fact shrink, expand time space. This is completely antithetical to what a forensic analyst should do, because we, we, we should not cut any source that we have, because we don't know. Maybe the important thing is just before or just after uh, what we cut. In fact, we need to use each one of those films in their entirety. So imagine that what replaces the modernist montage is the space of navigation. When, what means navigation? You have a space, conceptual or virtual space, in which all film exists in their totality, in which they're synced up. That film is before this, or coinciding with it, or etc. And you can move inside the model and start experiencing the film in a, as an act of navigation rather than an act of linear uh, montage. For that purpose, architecture is perfect. It is really like a viewing device. It's an apparatus of viewing films. Because the architectural models is what syncs up sometimes 70, sometimes 17, sometimes 700 images in time and space. You move through a, a certain um, image space, or what then you call build out. It's kind of like the space of the image becomes a navigable space. So here, is where you have the first clash, you know, between the necessity to splice and compose and the necessity to navigate within, or digitally navigate within space. And that is what uh, forensic architecture does. Sometimes we create film, but that is just simply because we need to present it in that mm -hmm. way. Our, uh, to be truly truthful to our work, we should not cut 
but we should navigate uh, mm -hmm. between them. The, the, the yes, but there's uh, one uh, very important uh, uh, aspect to your work is that you uh, you create uh, uh, two things. Uh, uh, you, you first of all you create a timeline mm -hmm. of of events. Uh, an event uh, has to be uh, decoded uh, uh, through its timeline. And secondly, uh, I think, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm inventing a, a, a term now, you, you create a space line. Uh, I'm, I'm borrowing from timeline to space yeah. line, which is a, a, a different reading of the event, not through uh, the uh, the uh, uh, chronological uh, happenings, but through uh, the, uh, the the uh, the the space where all this happened and the, the the understanding of the space, just like you understand the timeline, just like you understand the occurrence of, of the the event. Yeah, of course. So I mean, we have a term for this. We call it the architecture media complex, and. Um, what it is, is in fact synchronization of films. Often when we harvest, when we do open source research, i.e. we take material that people post online mm -hmm. and, um, and start composing something from it, um, we need to determine without metadata, because when you look it up from Facebook or Twitter, etc., it comes without metadata. There is a general understanding of space. They would say, well, we filmed that in the city of Rafa in, on that day, but you don't know exactly the time, and you don't know exactly the angle. So all that need to be reconstructed. So time and space, that is the relation between, so the, the time-space relation between images is architecture. Right? Mm -hmm. Architecture mm -hmm. stands as this, you know, you know, kind of like time, this sort of spatial timeline uh, that you constructed. Now, there, there is something about the conception of of secret, about the conception of investigation, that is very important when you when you deal with open source research. Let's let's take diagrammatically. It's kind of like a debate in you know, sort of like those people that push back against state secrets between people like, say, WikiLeaks. Uh, Julian Assange would say, well, you know, the evil of state happens in secret. Right? There is a barrier between what the state knows and what the public knows. And what we need to do through the leak is to find a hole and squeeze that information from the private, from the secret to the public domain. Other people, open source investigators say, well, hold on. There is so much open source material. There's so much information out there that is just not being looked at. And simply composing a relation between, you know, open source flight lines. You know, you, you have information about boats in the Mediterranean. You have you have images that, that exist. You have recordings that are kind of like already exist online. People just don't look at it and, and do not compose it. It's a different conception of like a secret in broad daylight rather than the leak. For example, the entire exposure of the extraordinary rendition of the CIA when the CIA was kidnapping people from one place, say, Pakistan, Afghanistan, sending them to Eastern Europe, sending them to East Africa, back into Yemen, up to, you know, at the time to Syria, to Jordan, all the food to be, to be tortured, etc., was exposed by people like uh, plane spotters, just marking out flight path that, that, that existed and seeing that you don't, you do not match on any kind of other commercial uh, activity. And the biggest secrets could also be exposed by a certain act of looking. And that looking is never a kind of a passive thing. That looking is always a composition. It's always a cross-referencing of, of huge amount of data and image. And that for us, the way of doing that is within a space architecture architectural models in particular, is the kind of the arena, it's the medium by which this kind of uh, synchronization uh, takes place. Having said that, and the sort of democracy of all of this information almost, in a presentation you have to yeah. have a hierarchy, and you have to decide what is being presented as and how. 
and particularly I suppose if you're presenting in an art space. You know, I have the sense that maybe, well, each of you has a very different approach and I suppose I'd like to know how you make those decisions, each sort of in the work of how much to show and how to show it. And I wonder if perhaps that is something that you two discuss when working together as well. I think that there is a, a, an issue of the language uh, adopted. And this is where we differ. We are very different. And uh, uh, although uh, I, well, I will return to it in a minute, I think uh, uh, in a way I'm also forensic, because I'm, I'm anti-editing. Yeah. Uh, and and um, uh, uh, in forensic architecture, uh, the, they have developed uh, a language of how uh, how you tell a story, mm -hmm. how uh, you depict an event, how you expose uh, uh, what uh, uh, actually occurred on the ground, and uh, 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 connected to uh, to. Uh, bigger issues. And uh, as a filmmaker, you also develop a language. You uh, 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 maybe not uh, uh, a systemized language necessarily, maybe a more uh, a language, a more fluid language, but you, you obviously, uh, you have your uh, rules, you have your codes, and, and uh, there are things that uh, you are uh, you, you tend to do and things that uh, you, you never do. Um, and uh, uh, what happened to me when I entered uh, uh, the lab was uh, uh, Eyal told me, look, we are uh, presenting uh, a certain case, the Um el Khiran case, uh, which was already presented before at uh, ICA uh, a few months ago. Uh, and uh, you will work on it uh, in the uh, in the re-editing. And I looked at the case uh, on the uh, that was the way it was presented at ICA and said, "What's wrong? Why why re-edit? Everything is okay. This is uh, you told the story the way you tell stories, and everything is fine." And he said, "No, look at the material, uh, the, the the raw material, raw footage, and." Uh, uh, Think in you. And uh, in the raw footage, I discovered a, a, a big uh, bin of material that they saw uh, endless times. But uh, I think that because we come from uh, different uh, languages, uh, they saw how to use it in one way, and it struck me that something different has to be. Uh, made. And this is a, a, a footage that uh, a, a photographer, a, a, an activist photographer, took uh, during the, the night of this event in Um el Khiran, where uh, a, a Bedouin uh, that, whose house was to be demolished was killed by the police just because he started driving his car away from the scene. And uh, once after, after he was shot, he ran over a policeman who died also. And there was this uh, activist uh, photographer uh, who was there. Uh, in the initial investigation, the sound uh, that was recorded by her camera was used to synchronize with other materials, uh, thermal image from a police helicopter, etc. But not the body of, uh, not her body, if you will, if you wish. Uh, and I discovered, and and of, obviously you don't see anything in in this uh, in this um, uh, uh, in these videos. You you don't see the event. She did, didn't see. She didn't know what was happening. She only understood it the following morning. She uh, where what she witnessed. But she was witnessing, and it was a very uh, uh, it was a horrific uh, 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 few hours, and, and uh, the material uh, showed this horror. So it's just the sound? 
it's, yeah, it's a sound and a lot of darkness, some lights, mm -hmm. uh, policemen pushing, lots of Push shouts. Okay. And there's a, there's a sound and dark. Yeah. And there's something uh, unbelievable happening there that at, uh, after a few shots, the, a car horn uh, starts honking and it honks for more than an hour. Ooh. And the first time I watched it, I, I removed the earphones and said, I can't stand this honk. <laughs> And then I understood that this honk was the most interesting, most... Uh, it, it, and, and she recorded the whole hour of the she show? Had, uh, she had cuts, but, uh, but uh, well, she recorded uh, uh, for more than uh, an hour. She recorded <laughs> for almost 12 hours, but with, with, uh, with lots of cuts in the middle. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is a, a, a nice chunk of uh, continuity uh, uh, that, uh, uh, of course, the forensics, right? the forensics, they put it on, on a timeline and you could tell exactly when she uh, uh, stopped recording and when she restarted and it's, it's all uh, data, data back. And she didn't know what she was recording? She didn't know. She didn't know what happened. She didn't know yeah, that there was a car. Nevertheless, she recorded an hour. I mean, well, she heard, she heard shots. Uh -huh. She knew somebody is hurt. There yeah. was, uh, people said somebody's dead, but she's unable to get near. Uh -huh. She doesn't even know to which direction to go. And when she, she captures the, 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 the car yeah. from a distance, she doesn't know that this is what she captures. Okay. And my forensic contribution was not to edit it. And I, I proposed to just show her a uh, complete video uh, until a certain moment uh, uh, at that night, unedited, just uh, uh, splice them together as, as mm -hmm. you know, uh, nowadays you, you uh, shoot on cards, so every, every shot is a, a, a separate uh, uh, file. But had, had she been a, a filmmaker, uh, had she shot in film or in, on, with cassettes, it would have been continuous. Mm -hmm. And this is what I, my, my proposal was and I thought that the sound, uh, and it's interesting because the sound is very, her sound is very important to investigation, but I thought it was very important to something different, to, to, to tell the story of the horror. The, With, the emotional kind of yeah. positioning there. So well, of course he said it in a very impolite <laughs> way. It's very, very yeah. interesting. I mean, why impolite? <laughs> why do I, why, what did I again did I do? <laughs> I suppose, and I so, but it's in a way that is really. But how, how do you get to these people? I mean, sorry. How did how did you get to that particular person? Okay, so it's we we need to maybe a little bit rewind okay. and say what is the story. So so forensic archive worked in the Negev for on another village for. Uh, with another village documenting the land right and the cycle of destruction of their village called Al Araki, about 20 kilometers away from there. So we had various connections on the ground with activists, and um, a, one of then there was an organization that we were working with called Active Steels. And Active Steels is a group of uh, Political, politically motivated photographers that go into places and um, and you know document issues of uh, human rights violation in relation to Israel and Palestine. And they were um, so Karen, the woman who was there in the in the uh, recorded that is a member of Actives. And another member of Actives, Oren Ziv, was actually based in London and working with us. When we woke up in the morning, we had the story that the Israeli police said is that there was a terror attack, that the Bedouin man charged with his car at the police intentionally, and the police had to kill him because he ran over and killed the policeman. And all the news simply yeah, repeated, repeated the government story. But active still, and other people on the ground called and said, this is absolutely insane, this is not correct. The person, then he gone, you know, revenge and, and, and driving at the police, or, or what exactly happened. And part of the gaps in Karen Manor, on, off, in the camera, she shot 96 films throughout this day, is her trying to upload it to us live. 
uh, in London while she is in between, in between recording, because we thought the intervention has to be very fast. And it was the fastest uh, investigation ever. We, um, we released our first report uh, after 24 hours. It had errors in it, but it was very fastly done. There were things that we did not notice in it, but it was clearly showing by syncing up police material, police helicopter material, with the sound of Karen Manor, that the police shot first, that the, 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 the battery man accelerated down the slope, lost control of the vehicle, and hit a policeman. And we just needed to push that out there before like checking all the kind of the dotting the, the I's and the P's or whatever. No? So we just pushed it out there. The Communist Party, the head of the Communist Party was there on the side. I was defending the village, I'm an order. And he was retweeting our analysis and the police accused him of fake news. He was also wounded in the event. He was yeah, wounded in the event, he was pepper sprayed, he was hit, he was shot you know, with something uh, to his face. And the police accused not him also of being of fake news and the video of being edited, of the Arab politicians that were there of inciting against the police and being responsible for the death of the police. And in fact, they were calling for taking, as they always do, for taking their immunity or effectively banning the Communist Party in the joint Arab list. So there was like, it was a major political issue. It was all about this microseconds of what has happened, but the implications <coughs> were, were, were great and political. And I think this is something that we go back to in, uh, in the analysis. So for us, what was important in this 24 hours is like, okay, she cannot see, but she hears. Her video shows only dark and moving dots. As non-documentaries, we were not particularly interested in, in those moving dots of light. And, and, and everything that went on, but the sound was there, there was a sound of gunshot, we could sync it up with the police video, and we could tell the story differently simply by the police video had vision and no sound, her had the sound but no vision, put together, the story was unfolding, and finally, after, after a while, the police even retracted and admitted that their story was false, so it had a positive uh, response. But for, for, for that, we, we, we left the, her, vision, her visuals at all. And when Avi came, he was going, this is why I say he was like, you know, pushing in a kind of like, you know, as, 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 <laughs> as we speak to each other, he was going like, are you crazy? Look what you have here. You never looked at the video as video itself. And then we started looking at it. And, um, and then, you know, I mean, there was, there was, there was debates. We no, but what, what was nice is that later the analysis and the model that you created of, of uh, the, the, the space allowed us to see what she didn't understand that she was seeing, was capturing, and that actually she captured the car several times, uh, although she was not aware that this is what she was doing. She tried to approach where the sound was, but she was not let to. But now, uh, uh, part of the analysis is to show how, uh, in certain moments, she is very near, and uh, the, uh, the 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 tools of the uh, forensic architecture allow to to, to, to 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 decode it and show exactly where she was, where the car was, and and uh, to to un, uh, un, uh, to expose the, the the event in a different level. So, so think about it like that. You see a black frame. You see a lot of moving lights in it. No, you know, the kind of like human conception in real time. You cannot say that this moving light is a police car and this moving light is the terrorist vehicle and this is, you know, activists going here. It just looks like lights moving. But when you slow it down, when you compose it, when you build a model, when you look frame by frame where it is, you can start breaking it apart. And this was, this was actually a, kind of a return to the image uh, that this collaboration actually uh, brought and about. And will the court accept that, and according to...? I don't know. We, we're going to, we're working now, we're submitting it, we're preparing it for the lawyer who represents the village. Mm -hmm. And she wants to open the, the case against the policeman. And uh, 
it might or it might not, and it's it's uh, it's not. There is no um, particular you know kind of evidentiary problem why they should not. But any any lawyer worth their name always objects to. Uh, we, we never actually submitted uh, any analysis to the court without the lawyers of the other side objecting to that, or trying to poke holes, and that's just their job. So who knows? It's always it's also a practice that is unrecognized yet yeah. by, by the courts to, to be legitimate. Uh, yeah, because they can argue that you reconstruct the same way. Of course, they, they yeah. it, but the court doesn't argue. The court is that you know the other side would argue. No, no, no. Of course, yeah. we, we would but, fight it out. And but, we'll see. Normally, courts uh, objected to, yeah. to medical forensics also uh, in the yeah. beginning, no? I, we are talking about that during really the first phase of the trial, and so we are not really talking about the medical One of the reasons, the kind of the spectrum of, of objections that we encounter, always start, okay, you're a political activist and then we pull all, you know, if it's in Israel, Palestine, we pull, you know, the fact that I'm a BDS supporter, all the petitions I've signed, you know, it's not in a, kind of a neutral thing. Then they would say, uh, what is this group of artists and architects, you know, they're not scientists, right? Mm -hmm. And then they would use the fact that we present in exhibitions to prove that we are artists rather than scientists. Mm -hmm. When we present in exhibitions, when we, we had a piece in the, in the last documenta, the reviewer said, oh, this is not art, this is evidence. What is, it, you know, like, what is it doing? So it kind of like sits uncomfortably between them. And the reason, I think, for the suspicion is that people perceive of aesthetics as a kind of a license to fictionalize. But I, it, be that as it may, and I'm not contesting that, uh, I think that uh, aesthetic practices, image practices, um, are, could also have truth value. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that attention to image, looking at images through images, composing, etc., uh, requires a certain and deep understanding of image that is not only technical, but is uh, a kind of fluency, a kind of literacy, image literacy, that comes from photographic uh, theory and visual cultures and kind of much more deep and critical understanding uh, of image, of uh, issues of representation. Uh, of uh, threshold of visibility, of blur, of interference, of um, position, mm -hmm. etc. That, that are very important when you try to understand and enhance, you know, usually what we have is we call it like we have very sort of weak signals, poor evidence. We don't have the same evidence that states have. We don't have a helicopter flying over overhead with thermal imaging doing it on our own terms. We can only take the low resolution one that they put online. We can only take the sort of like the partial perspective of activists and residents as they film. So this is like weak evidence that we have. But to enhance that power, you need to really kind of think through what images are, how to interpret and compose. And when those things are issues that pure scientists uh, cannot do. So who is better than you know aesthetic practitioners of an image to look at the images and, and actually kind of understand? So there is there is two battles going on here. One is, you know, let's say with the authorities about what happened and the truth. And the other one is what is contemporary aesthetical political possibilities exist and how to think how to think about image, image operation, how to think about the agency of uh, artists, filmmakers, etc., in a different way. I mean, how to think about the evidentiary value of art, uh, truth claims, etc. 
And I think that these are issues that are not obvious neither for artists nor for the court. I, it's not accepted uh, easily by, by both sides. But whenever we present you know, forensic material in our context, they say, oh, well, you know, you have like a, a certain kind of like a, a linear, almost scientific kind of interest in the image and you can strip it out of other things, etc. So I, I think that there is, that there is a, a, a space that we need to navigate between those two worlds. And I don't know if we navigate it successfully. I know that when we cannot go to court, we need to make our investigation public. So we put it online, we put it in newspapers, and when we can, we'll put it in the gallery because we know that there's 50,000 in a good, good sense, uh, in a good case, that people that would see it. It's a, just another forum to, to expose and show the other. You know, you know Mania, uh, uh, well, luckily, uh, art uh, changes, and it's uh, not, uh, uh, well, it's not, uh, we don't have a clear, uh, uh, concept of what is art. I uh, just imagine uh, uh, something that I'm sure you, you are aware of, because you are also an artist and you make documentaries, that uh, uh, documentaries in galleries is something that uh, has a history of maybe 20, 25 years, no more than that. I remember the first time that one of my short films was invited to be exhibited in a gallery and uh, a few years before that, when I made a, a, a short video that was documentary based, I and I looked at it. I loved it, but I I I was not satisfied uh, with uh, where, with the the genre. I, I and I I thought it was uh, uh, it was supposed to be art. But it didn't look like art. It looked like documentary. So I added uh, some kind of a, a, a visual effect. Uh, Z32 is uh, like that. Uh, well, not this kind, but <laughs> yeah. really a filter to the image that uh, turned it to more arty. Uh, I, and I admit it, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. It was uh, the, the state of things at the moment. And uh, today I will not, not. I love this work. I will not remove the 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 uh, this filter. But at the time, in order to take, and this was uh, uh, late 1990s, and at uh, the time, in order to to place something like this, which is totally documentary, and and uh, uh, yet not narrative. Uh, but absolutely documentary in in a con in a, in an art context, it it was still uh, strange. Mm. So uh, this uh, I, I think that um, art can contain um, uh, many different practices, and uh, the the question is not uh, uh, I think of the materiality of the of the work, but uh, what it leaves. Yeah. after, what it uh, leaves you with, mm. Where, uh, what do you take with it. And uh, I, again, I don't want to, to say what is art and what you have to be left with when you watch art, but apparently uh, it, uh, forensic architecture lives in, in an artistic uh, space also, and, uh, and uh, uh, with no, uh, I don't think there's any problematics with that. Of course, uh, but also, so, yeah, please, please. Well, I was going to ask you something, and well, moving on from that one bit of footage you were talking about, I think it was important from an event, evidentiary point of view, but also from a kind of emotive point of view because of this kind of human experience and maybe the chaos and, and perhaps the fact that the, the violence is happening elsewhere and, that, and the confusion, and that's something in Z32 that is very present as well, I think, and Manuel's work very often one to one, for example, you know, similar to Zed first two is this story of a kind of horrific violence. It's a, it's an acid attack in that case, mm -hmm. a kind of killing slash murder, depending on how you Zed thirty two. And I wanted to ask about that idea of the violence happening elsewhere and and leaving things out, which obviously is difficult from a from a from a kind of more scientific or evidentiary kind of 
proposal. And also but, Ella talks in his interview about slowing violence, that mm. I think it's a really good point, but mm. body that in the checkpoint that then the people they are fat, they couldn't go mm. in. And no, it's really humiliated. I don't <laughs> like that part about my films, honestly. It's <laughs> <laughs> Abby's day. I won't just look at both. Oh, like, like us, you have no ego. <laughs> 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 but, but thank you. But I was just I don't I was trying to moderate, but, but thank you. But that, I'm, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> to I'm curious to do it both. But but it's uh, very interesting that exactly about the uh, slow violence that um, in Z32, uh, we don't have any really action that, but we have really deep, painful, suffering, violence behind exactly the moss. Mm -hmm. And that you're trying to show us, sometimes for me it's a little bit metaphorical, it's like a dad, look at that, many people are living in moss and they are killer between us. Yeah, of course. But also, other hand, then I uh, listened to your interview. You talked about the building and city that they are sometimes and also relationship between people in the city and everything that between the government and people is a slowly a slow violence. That is, a, it was exactly like his film. When you look at that step by step, you are going in and in and in, and then oh my God, at the end when the film finished. The, really painful thing and very suffering. Can you talk both about this point of uh, your opinion about violence in your work? Because of course the politics and killing, war, everything is violence, but I believe that uh, is some country that they have a democracy, but they think they are thinking that they have freedom, but freedom sometimes then who wants to control freedom is a part of the violence and is is not freedom. And can you tell me exactly a little bit about this point? Uh, look, I uh, uh, I made uh, two films, one short and one long. Uh, that uh, have uh, uh, phone conversations uh, in them. The long one is avenged but one of my two eyes, and uh, the, the, the skeleton of the film is made of uh, phone conversations with uh, uh, a person uh, who's under uh, curfew in, uh, uh, in Betzaho, in, uh, in the occupied territories near Bethlehem. Uh, and at the same period, I was recording also conversations with another person who was under uh, a curfew in, uh, in Ramadan. And you hear sometimes my children and a few friends, so you hear voices of children. There's a television set on, on, the, on the desk, and you see uh, current news. Mm -hmm. This was during, uh, uh, it was in 2002, Operation Defensive Shield. In, uh, during which uh, the uh, Israeli army uh, reoccupied the Palestinian cities. And we start talking on the phone, I call him, uh, and he said, yes, the soldiers were just here. They are checking all the uh, apartments in the buildings, and when there's a, a, an apartment uh, uh, that's where there's no one there, they blow the door. So we gave them the keys to two other apartments because their residents are away and in the hope that they will not uh, uh, blow, the door, blow up the doors. And uh, they took my ID and, uh, and then we continued talking. You don't, so you, you only see me, yes? Yeah. Yeah, you, obviously you hear his voice, but you, you don't you speak in Hebrew. He's a, a Palestinian who grew up in Nazareth. He speaks perfect Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we start talking, and I, I, like I said, what do you think will happen? And so we start to talk about politics, uh, about uh, what the, the thoughts are in the, in the Palestinian street, what they expect, what they are willing. Then he goes to speak, to tell about uh, uh, the Palestinian experience uh, in uh, the, the uh, negotiation with Ehud Barak, who was 
prime minister uh, until a little, a few months earlier, uh, etc. And then at a certain moment he said, uh, wait, it's the soldiers are hanging up now. And he hangs up. And there's a do, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like in cinema. <laughs> and uh, uh, and I try to call again, and there's the, the phone is cut, and I can't get through. And then for the next, this this lasted about seven minutes, and for the next eight, mi eight minutes, I walk around, I watch television. Arik Sharon, Ariel Sharon, is on television talking about what he will do to the Palestinians, <laughs> and there's uh, and. Nothing happens. My children continue to, uh, to play in the corridor. And uh, uh, obviously, our life is safe and perfect. Uh, so uh, yeah, th this is like, uh, uh, and, and the absence of, of this uh, person on the other side that uh, can be reached. And the, the, the video ends with me trying to call again and, and uh, the line uh, is, uh, is, uh, sounds like uh, there's no uh, communication, no contact. And uh, the, the, for me, the, 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 the fact that uh, he's uh, again, George, again becomes a present absentee, and that uh, at, the, at the very moment that I'm uh, there uh, with my family, uh, completely protected and secure, uh, he, uh, soldiers uh, have entered his home, and I, uh, can you imagine soldiers entering your home? Can, can you imagine soldiers entering your home and being polite, just asking questions? Uh, no, they don't have to be uh, uh, very violent, just a group of people totally armed with, with rifles, and, and uh, it's... Uh, I, I think I think this is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. what do you think? I think that um, just like this example where the, the in a certain sense, no, like the, the beep that you hear while he's not there is almost like the beep on the in the film that yeah. that, that we've made now, not the, the car horn. I you know that when the car horn is there. Um, something has happened to the car or the body, you know, the person that is hit, and he's effectively bleeding to death. Never mind the mechanics exactly of it, but the beef is kind of like the process of a man dying. And uh, here also, you know, that this disconnection is, is something that I, the inability to establish communication is already in itself the act of violence. And you think sometimes about acts of violence and, or the, or the the nature of violence, not only to destroy people or things, but to destroy the traces of violence at all taking place. Sometimes violence also destroys the capacity to record itself. You know, this is what happened with this woman in, the, in at night. Because it was so violent, and the soldiers start pushing. And, you know, she, she doesn't know. I mean, the, the violence destroys its own traces. It destroys the instrument of measure. Not only, you imagine an earthquake, and you have like the Richter sensors, but imagine an earthquake so strong that also destroy the instrument mm -hmm. that, could, that could even record it. Right? Yeah. And I think that, nice. that, that what we're talking about is, um, is, is also an attempt of, sometimes of states, to destroy the capacity of, of their violation, whether they do not allow independent investigators there, whether they're shooting at people with cameras, which is now the shoot to kill policy of Israeli soldiers during operation. You film at them, they will shoot you. Uh, there's a beautiful work by Rabbi Mreyev, a common friend of us, a Lebanese uh, theater director artist, on cameras, activists recording their own death by, you know, you, you see somebody recording a in, in this case, a Syrian soldier during the early years of the Syrian revolution, the cameras are falling. We collected all of those, or all those that you could find, scenes by which the camera records the death of the photographer by uh, dropping in, in that subject. 
So this no, no, you, don't, aspect, you normally don't see the photographer. Yeah, you don't see, but you see but what he would have seen. Of course, every camera records from both ends. The camera records what the lens is aiming at, the, or the people, things, the movement that the lens is aiming at, but it's also recording the movement of the photographer. A blur image is almost like a superimposed image of the photographer on that because the movement or the, 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 the some people when they're scared and they're running, the, the blare is like an auto portrait mm -hmm. you know, that is superimposed, like, like you're looking from a full halfway mirror. So cameras record from the both ends. And, and, I'm, I'm, and I guess we're both interested in how to break through the capacity of violence to erase its own traces. And, um, and what you mentioned, Mania, about slow violence that interested you so much is a violence that doesn't look like that. We, 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 you know, we, we're very used to see on TV, etc., violence, that you see somebody getting shot, uh, or you see some kind of collision, some kind of kinetic force um, is, is an act of violence. But a lot of the violence, in fact, a lot of the very lethal violence of war happens as slow processes, incremental accretion uh, of, you know, the degradation of, degradation of conditions of life, mm. of the drying out of places, of the slow toxicity that accumulates at a point made by a, a literary theorist called Rob Nixon on, on the kind of the incapacity to, to, to image slow violence. Mm. Uh, it is something that is, it is so unimageable that we don't even understand it as violence. And I think that my earlier work, the one you saw in Al Jazeera, on architecture, on infrastructure, on landscape, and planning is to show <coughs> that things that do not look like violence, red roofs, single family homes, roads, bits of infrastructure, are actually hugely lethal forms of intervention, leading cumulatively to the death, perhaps, of more people than the, kind of the kinetic force of bombs and you know, shots. So, so how to, to, we need to find new ways to to image that violence that is erased. Whether it's the beat or the slow violence or the, this kind of and sometimes what the, the, the actual act of erasure and I think this is uh, going back to obvious thing is the violence in its own thing. I mean the beep on the phone, that thing that erases information. You don't know what is happening. This is uh, the violence in its own I would like, I, was, I have my last question and then the people can... Also, I just mentioned it's 6 o'clock. I'm not oh, sure what time just, just, just quickly, just one last question <laughs> that <laughs> then we have the people, because he has a time until 6.30. Just 15 no, 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 no. minutes. Yeah, he has a... Uh, okay. that, yeah, he, yes. she's there. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, I'm coming from poetic country, honestly. And it is, I think, Z32... It's about quality, but it's <coughs> poetic. What, what do you think about this point in your world, and how we can find in, in, in the art language about the uh, poetic language? What is, what is this for both? I know at least that's, I think we talked about this before, about the poetic themes poetic cinema, poetic language. Mania refers to our last week uh, meeting here when she spoke Persian and I spoke Hebrew. <laughs> so apparently this is yes. what we talked about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. we talked about poetic. That it had an interview but without any translation. <coughs> because really it was really beautiful and poetic. And I think that it's very important. But I would love to know that when you're talking about architect and political subject and this kind of painful story, when you are in the process, what is your feeling about poetic language? I, I'm, I'm very curious about it. You know, I think, I think that very often we, you know, in kind of colloquial use, we say po poetic when you think this is something that is emotional or moving. I, I, mm -hmm. I find in poetry also issues of, of rhythm, of structure, and in particular, a kind of what is very important for me in kind of in a poetic mode is a way of entering from the singular to the general. 
And I think how to enter a kind of like an, a situation, a person, an incident. Let's go back because we always talk about that particular incident. A few seconds or a split second. And bring it back and nest that moment in the history of which it is part. Or, or start navigating and narrating longer historical process or longer principle, longer kind of like issues to do with, with what it is to live together and what, are the, what, what, what is a uh, larger kind of social political condition in the situation. But fundamentally, the question of how to live together that are encapsulated in, you know, a fourth of a second, you know, is if that moment, that, that, that split second is a kind of a, an entry point like, like a kind of a hologram that you can enter and enter into it and find in it uh, the world of which it is so this is Please, if you have any How to live together is peace, love and understanding, no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have any question, friends, just 15 minutes from... Yeah, please. Um, I feel that this approach that is scientific, artistic, uh, what else? There were four. It is legal and political. Has certain philosophical or ontological understandings as assumptions that there is a single truth that has to be discovered. There is a linear conception of causality of space and time <coughs> that is, for me, in philosophical terms, a bit positivistic. I understand that the at the end of the day, this has to be able to be presented in a court, and we cannot have the luxury of being a bit postmodern here and saying, okay, everybody has their own truth and full stuff. We have to discover something that can be presented and can be uh, potent not, enough. No, you're absolutely true. There needs to be a kind of an ontological understanding of truth and statement that come from here. And my conception of truth is not that uh, it is solid and unmellable, but it's it's like a common, it's a common project under construction, made out of the situated, the, the, the sum total of situated perspectives that exist. But in order for politics to happen, we need to agree on the common, on what holds us together, on what world we live in, on what is right and what is wrong, what is, what is pollutant and what is perhaps... Uh, uh, and I feel that right now, you know that in this kind of like in this you know the short circuit of kind of like post truth and you know fake news and all, all this crap that is kind of you know supposedly new but actually we've been living in because in colonial reality in an anti colonial conflict you know that that which now came to the mainstream as a political strategy has always been there. Um, the kind of the truth is the first kind of like casualty of that, is an attack on a common resource. Right? It's just like, just like you pollute a river or the air, etc. The kind of the distortion and pollution of the possibility of verification. Not so much, the problem with truth is not so much to say that is the truth and there is nothing wrong and it's holy and it will always be like that. But we need to agree that the sum total of situated perspectives can produce a common and that is a process of verification. And what I find in, in now in the political reality uh, of attack on, on very basic statement, evolution, you know, on climate change, on, on human rights violations, on any, any kind of size of, of crowd in this, on, on, on effect of Brexit, etc., is that it's not really about that truth. What is attacked is the principle of verification, I mean, the principle of, of a possibility that is imperfect, that is always in flux, to create a common knowledge. Consensus. Consensus is too, is, is too hard, because consensus already hardens, right? Already hardens. If there is, think of it as a malleable thing, but think of it as a, as, as a common project under construction that is continuously approximated, but holds us in relation to each other. We can agree that this place is called that, that it belongs to this person, 
that it's wrong to take it, right? The minute that, that the contours, what, what we are facing is a kind of a new form of propaganda. So the propaganda of the Cold War was to say, well, socialism is worse than capital or something like that. Today, the propaganda that we see you know, on Twitter or on, on, on other things is effectively taking away your capacity to understand and agree on anything. That simply becomes the truth is in the eye of the beholder. And that what happens? Power fills that gap. And, and, and manipulates that. Rather than build the truth as, as a, as a multi-perspectival construction site, it becomes, it empties out, you, you say you empty it out into kind of this relativism, cross-modern, whatever, and that is, that vacuum is being sucked into uh, those in power to manipulate it. So this is, this is the difference, I think, between positivism and, um, and, and, and our understanding of truth. Next question. Uh, I think that. Yes. I think Gail may have. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Ayal, um, and thank you very much, Abby. And thank you, Abby. Are we going to just pull you around? Know, we're going to have a quick changeover and just and dim the lights, and everybody can come in and come find somewhere you, to sit. After watching the film, you, you can have a QA and a and question with Abby. And I'm sure after watching the beautiful, not beautiful, I don't know how to pronounce it. That's an amazing film. Truthful <laughs> film. <laughs> we, we can talk maybe later about uh, the uh, and you the have a lot positivist of uh, artist. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much.